Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Idea Me Show, where we are moving the human story forward. I'm Anna Guzman, Space Ambassador for Idea Me. 2020 is set to have the busiest launch schedule yet in aerospace history. With every launch and payload delivery, some rocket parts may linger in lower Earth orbit for long periods of time. There are also many decommissioned satellites that are no longer in use, stationed in geosynchronous orbit. These lingering remains are referred to as space debris or space junk. After decades of launches, payload deliveries, and space travel, it is starting to get a little cluttered. Just a few days ago, I was able to interview Charity Whedon, Vice President of Global Space Policy at Astroscale. We talked about space policy and mitigation practices to alleviate the current situation of space debris and methods of prevention to ensure spaceflight safety in the future. Here's my interview with Charity. I hope you find it interesting. Good morning, Charity. Thank you for uh, carving out some time in your very busy schedule to sit down with me and chat uh, about space debris and other things that Astroscale is up to. Um, Give us a brief introduction. Tell our audience, who are you? Hi, and thanks for having me, Anna. It's uh, quite a pleasure. Uh, My name is Charity Whedon. I'm the Vice President of Global Space Policy at Astroscale US. Um, Astroscale is a global company looking to solve a global issue of space debris and keeping space sustainable for future generations through the technology that we're developing. Uh, my, a little bit of my background, I was uh, in the Royal Canadian Air Force for 23 years. I flew in the back of an aircraft called the CP-140. It's like a long-range patrol aircraft. I then uh, really wanted to get into the space field for Canadians back then really NORAD was the place to go. So I was sent to NORAD um, as one of the uh, personnel tracking space debris from Cheyenne Mountain. And from then on, I really kept up with the space operations, went to the Canadian Space Agency for a few years, and my final assignment was at the Canadian Embassy as the Assistant Attaché for Air and Space Operations here in Washington, D.C. After that, I decided to leave service and Start a new career in industry. I spent a couple years as a, the policy lead at the Satellite Industry Association here in DC, helping the satellite community bring forward their issues and thoughts uh, to policymakers and legislators. And then I met Astroscale. <laughs> what I wanted to do uh, in my second part of my career was essentially three things. I was really, I really liked hard policy problems. You know, if, if government official says, no, you can't do that, I ask why. And I, just coming, coming up with fresh ideas and, and the new markets that were available for the commercial industry, space industry, was just so much growing. So policy, hard policy problems was my thing. Space sustainability was also my thing. You know, taking those lessons from Cheyenne Mountain and tracking pieces of debris. And then finally, that international diplomacy, being able to work together internationally uh, with partners and allies to solve a hard problem. So Astroscale really fit right in the middle of that, um, and I've been with them since uh, full time since last July. From my point of view, it seems like there's not enough coverage or uh, awareness out there about space debris. Um, you know, for instance, the general public or anybody who is not very in tune into the aerospace industry, you know, you see all the rockets launching and satellites being put put up in orbit, but a lot of people really aren't thinking the consequence of that, of, of decades of, you know, more hardware going into orbit. And I noticed uh, the last count is tens of thousands of all kinds of space debris of all kinds of sizes and it's not just lower earth orbit right it's um in the geosynchronous orbit as well right so um a little update to your numbers it's in the hundreds of millions <laughs> oh my gosh like <laughs> depends what what um size of debris you're counting um even the micro you know one or two millimeters uh small sizes those are in 
multitude, a hundred, you know, 120, I think, is the, the number that the European Space Agency provides. And as you ramp up, so one millimeter object traveling seven kilometers a second, um, I need to do my math for miles an hour there, mm -hmm. uh, really fast. And it, it still, uh, it, it, you know, it, it will still create enough energy to damage something in space. Mm -hmm. um, when you move up to one centimeter, that's when, you know, yes, that could destroy a satellite or if it hits the wrong uh, part of it. And those, those are in the, you know, around the 500,000 to 900,000 pieces range. When you get up to um, 10 centimeters and up, that's where we have the best tracking capability mm -hmm. uh, for space surveillance. So 10 centimeters and up, there are about 30,000 pieces there. Mm. So depends um, which orbits, because there is more congestion in some orbits, more debris events have happened in other orbits. Um, so this isn't just, you know, pieces of debris spread throughout equally mm -hmm. uh, across the orbits. This is actually concentrated in some areas. And, you know, the, the, the point you made on, we don't really, know, you know, think about this issue it's because it hasn't really affected uh, us here on Earth yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and w this is one thing that would be a drastic um, change to the way we live and communicate and you know our economy if there were ever to be a catastrophic event or a slowly increasing debris population. So that's what we see coming um, the past 60 years has produced that level of debris and what we're seeing now is this new burgeoning space industry with thousands of satellites being launched and we're like wait okay so 60 years has gotten us to this level what more complicated what is going to be more complicated is the congestion when thousands more uh, pieces or satellites uh, go up so we're really at a we're at a very interesting time where we're about to have a step function in using space and uh, enjoying the benefits of space. We have data, unlimited data essentially um, from remote sensing. We have you know, communications capability, internet of things coming from space. But that's all at stake if we let the debris population rise unchecked. There has been a few times that the space station has had to maneuver out of their trajectory a little bit or be raised or lowered to avoid uh, an impact, right, from uh, space debris? Yes, this happens, um, I don't have the exact numbers, but this happens on the order of, you know, one time a year or so. Mm -hmm. There's also been reports that um, they found out a little too late and they didn't have time to do the maneuver and so they had the astronauts go into the emergency Soyuz. That's it, right. Yeah, I remember that. Really frightening. <laughs> you know, if, if there's going to be a hole in the space station, quick get in. Um, you know, so this does absolutely impact human space flight and we're seeing, you know, uh, space tourism uh, starting to blossom and starting to get on its feet and launch and, and there's a lot of interest in this uh, so that puts a new dimension on uh, the problem of we do want to leverage space and enjoy it and um, benefit from it but we need to be aware first of all and we need to mitigate prevent any future collisions and we also have to remediate which means we have to have a cure to what we've already done so far so all these pieces together, the awareness, the prevention, and the cure, if we can package all this together, we have a sustainable space environment for the future. Um, so I saw on, uh, I believe it was LinkedIn, uh, your blog about the updated uh, practices that mm -hmm. NASA has submitted because they had not updated it since 2001. Um, but that is, you know, improvement on what you're talking about in mitigation practices. Um, but that's under the uh, jurisdiction, let's say, of the U.S. Is there someone 
kind of policing in on the international level to make sure that all these countries launching and putting satellites into orbit are abiding by cer a certain type of protocol? Um, the Outer Space Treaty is probably the closest thing of a, an agreement between nations, though. Mm -hmm. There's no overlooking authority or police, uh, you know, sort of enforcement mechanism internationally. That's just not the way the United Nations and the, our, our, our uh, international com community works. The sovereignty and the authority always rests on the domestic uh, bodies. So it's up to groups of like-minded nations, which right now in Copius, there's over 90 like-minded nations that have come together and agreed upon long-term sustainability guidelines. Just the basics of make sure you regulate domestically um, space activities. Please share information about situational awareness um, and, and uh, you know, you know what you're doing in space, so there's no misconceptions or there's a better understanding of what's happening in space. So there's there's agreement at the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is meeting this week and next week, by the way. Hmm. Uh, and, and and so that's a good step forward. But will there ever be an international space cop? Um, you're gonna have to ask the lawyers on that one. I, I tend to believe I, I like how it's situated now or domestically. We get together uh, and we decide in consensus uh, how things are supposed to go forward and then policing inside your own country. And um, from your efforts and going around the world and meeting with, with these people, what is your feeling? Is it, is it a positive outlook that the countries and the agencies are really trying to you know, to mitigate the situation, make it better? I think there's a lot more attention being paid to this issue. I think the, the, the visible launches that are occurring, especially in 2020, last night, 34 satellites were launched successfully, which is wonderful to see, um, 60 at a time from, from SpaceX as well. So um, it's, uh, it's in front of us every day. So I feel that internationally regulators and policymakers are more aware that there is more going up into space. And they're thinking of how can I get part of that future space economy? Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start thinking about how can I uh, participate in that future space economy, you're going to be faced with the, the uh, impacts and the, um, the risks associated with that. And one of those risks is space debris. So I feel that Internationally, communities are caring about this. Um, th there's a lot more education to be had, I feel, uh, but we're getting there. Also, I, I assume what helps is to realize their investment of millions of dollars of launching something into space or the loss of human life is, is very significant and would be a, a, a helpful way to convince them <laughs> to partake, right? <laughs> No greater motivation than the, the threat of hard regulation and, and, and you know, but, buckling, or, you know, buttoning down um, industry and innovation. Nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's this internal incentive uh, for companies to make sure they act responsibly and I'm pretty sure their investors believe that too, or their stakeholders, um, or shareholders rather, mm -hmm. in in making sure the orbits that they go to are sustainable and they can leverage their investment and make a return on their investment. Because if there are several dead satellites in your orbit, you're going to be wasting money, um, either trying to avoid them, or uh, if you know hopefully not a collision happens but if something happens then you're even more polluting that environment for which your your bottom line comes from right so besides um assisting in policy making uh you all are also building hardware um okay. to help with this and you have a new mission um that will be launching soon right yes it's called end of life services by astroscale demonstration it's launching later this year and what this entails is we need to test the technology um, that will 
be that remediation piece that I was talking about. Actually, it's a little both, mitigation and remediation. We have a, um, a mock space of debris that we're bringing up with us, and it has a docking plate on it. And this docking plate is a circular, um, lightweight, non-intrusive, and, and it can be attached to by magnet. It's, it has those magnetic properties. And we have the servicing satellite that is attached to it with a magnetic arm. So what we'll do when we go up and do this demonstration is we'll separate, of course, and we'll test that magnetic arm. Does it attach? Yes, great. Um, how about let's deattach and institute a tumble in the mock piece of debris? Because let's face it, if there is a dead satellite up there, it won't be likely, you know, on the straight and narrow. It'll be like tumbling or it will be doing something. So we're going to need to be able to capture that as well. So we will practice that. And then the final uh, demonstration would be to um, lose lock with it and uh, with the, the mock piece of debris and go find it. Because, you know, that's going to be a, an item that needs to be done as well. Is where, where, you know, how do you navigate space and do this properly and safely. So we have uh, um, a part of the demonstration to do that as well. And then finally, we will deorbit it, um, the, the uh, mock piece of debris. Unfortunately, our servicer will go down with it uh, mm -hmm. and burn up in the atmosphere. But this is a demonstration to test the guidance and navigation systems, the attachment mechanisms, the docking plate, um, and, and the process and the operations that we hope to be doing very soon. And at what or what orbit are you um, performing this test? It will go up anywhere between 500 and 600 kilometers. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so low, lower Earth orbit. Wow, that's amazing. And where are you launching from and when? Uh, so <laughs> the, the date is the latter part of uh, 2020. That's, that's all I have right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're launching from Baikonur. Oh, okay. Um, so how many tests uh, are on your milestone or timeline until you're officially operating? Well, we just have this one on our timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, once we test and prove out this technology, uh, you know, we're, we're ready and we're open for um, business. And this is um, directed towards new hardware that's about to fly, right? Not existing um, dead satellites that are already in orbit. This is a critical piece of it. We are designing a satellite to be captured. And this hasn't happened quite before. Uh, satellite operators tend to, you know, think just, you know, you know we'll design the spacecraft, we'll send it up, it'll naturally deorbit. Um, but that's not necessarily the right way to do things anymore. Mm -hmm. Designing your spacecraft so it can be captured just in case something happens to it and you cannot deorbit naturally in the time that's needed uh, is the new standard we'd love uh, for all operators to take on. So uh, we will be, um, that, that is a critical piece to design your satellite with end of life services in mind. The stuff that's up there right now, if it's intact and whole, um, it's still possible to remove it if they're in the way and it's a highly congested area and it's highly risky to keep it there. But it just makes it more complicated of a mission. Mm -hmm. And is your, I know you mentioned that this test, your servicer will be going into orbit and, and burn up with the item that it pulls. Yeah. Is that the intent of future missions, or are your servicers eventually going to pull back up into orbit after it pulls the debris down? Uh, yeah, you never want to. Um, uh, that would be costly, wouldn't it? <laughs> satellite, it's not a fun thing. A lot of heart and soul and, and yeah. investment into it. So, future iterations, we are thinking of how can we reuse this this capability. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a it's a problem right now with especially geostationary satellites that are they're lasting 20 25 years but they only have fuel for 15 and and so that's why on orbit servicing um, is an important element of this conversation as well is 
can we refuel in space or can we have a package added onto it so we can go up and down there's all these tr uh, trade-offs and engineering studies that we'll be doing uh, to make sure that we can uh, reuse a perfectly good servicer to go up and, and help remove debris so it seems like in your career path you were always meant to be in aerospace um, or was this kind of like a, all of a sudden you had a dream or you saw something that inspired you and thought, okay, I want to be involved in space? Well, probably like 99% of people who want to do a space career, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you ever try? <laughs> I did, yes. Uh, so it was, it was odd. Um, in high school, I went to space camp the, mm -hmm. for the you know high school is called Space Academy mm -hmm. and I was hooked I mean I everything I did was was focused on how do I make the the most straightforward pathway for me to to be, set myself up for for success mm -hmm. uh, for an astronaut program and uh, growing up in Canada that is tough to do because mm -hmm. there was <laughs> selections every 20 years essentially so you had a time you know, be born the right year, essentially, um, to get the chance. I, I noticed at that time in, in high school that they were, there was a selection going on. And the, the folks they selected were either uh, military, you know, pilots or brain surgeons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For the equivalent, I'm like, I don't think I'm that, you know, I'm not going to run and get my PhD right now. I'd love to do the military side of things. Mm -hmm. And so off I went on an adventure, um, joined the military and uh, got to do, you know, such incredible things around the world and, and saw the world and, you know, every two or three years had a brand new job, had to figure it out. Um, some was engineering, some was operations, some was policy, some was dip diplomacy. And I just really found um, the policy side really uh, interesting to me and something that I could actually influence. Uh, I never did uh, get a chance to make it too far in the 2008 selection, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I continued my path as space as a vector, not a destination. It, it led me to uh, where I am today, making decisions and making influence on how we're going to use space in the future. I tell you though, I'm pretty sure there are many envious people that you got to work at NORAD in Cheyenne Mountain, especially Gen Xers that grew up watching the movie War Games. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I and I I walked I, I prefer to walk inside of a mountain every day <laughs> bus and just really absorbing every day what I got to do. I it's this weird thing when you walk in first thing in the morning, maybe 6.30, 7 in the morning, you're walking up to a building that you're like, wow, I'm here. And that happens many times of my career. Walking up to Cheyenne Mountain, wow, I'm here and I'm walking inside. Walking up to the Canadian Space Agency, I'm here. Walking up to a hangar, and you know, when all you hear is the, the hum of the, the, the aircraft in the background, and I'm like, this is really cool. So I've had many of these moments of, this is really cool. <laughs> that was one of them. Um, did you have a, a mentor some somehow along the way that really um, helped you? Uh, there were dozens and dozens of people. <laughs> it takes a village to help charity, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, really, um, I've had mentors, whether they know it or not, along the way helping me. Mm -hmm. um, have you paid it forward? Do you have someone that you've helped... I try to pay it forward. Um, I find that in this area of my career where I'm, I'm established and I have a bit of a hindsight, <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel I have more to say and more to, you know, to offer uh, those that are coming up behind me and trying to give them a heads up of what it's like to, to be in this business. Um, you know, those that are in the military or, or desire to go in the military of, of how that dynamic works, um, but things do change over a couple decades, and I feel I've I've lost a little bit of touch of what it means to start out new. But there are some lessons there that uh, I've been trying to pass along. I am a mentor for a great organization called the Brooke Owens Fellowship, 
-hmm. and they bring in undergraduate uh, female and and, uh, gender minority um, uh, fellows every year and then match them with a space company or aerospace company and a mentor. Uh, And I've been lucky enough the last uh, couple years to do that and and kind of do those pass along um, guidances to them. Yeah, that's certainly a better education sometimes than just sitting in the classroom, right? Yeah, yeah, the the you know classroom of life, if you will. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, making your way through it. That's kind of one of the lessons I try and pass along is like get your get your feet and your hands dirty. Right. Just go go and do it. Right. right. Um, do you, you know, have a role model or a hero, somebody that you haven't met yet that you would have loved to have met or would like to meet? Um, I'm the type of person that if, if there's someone I want to meet, I'll reach out. <laughs> I'm not shy about that. There's just, you know, there's, there's, there's folks that um, I highly respect and I've modeled my career um, after. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Hadfield comes to mind, obviously. He's, he's the reason why I joined the military. Um, um, heroes. Heroes and mentors are one and the same for me because I, I really value their their um, their mentorship and their advice. Um, okay, if we're going to name names, I'm going to say Andre Dupuy. He's a, a well-known space um, expert in Canada. Um, yeah, there's so many. There's so mm-hmm. many. And I'm going to, lo- you know, forget names if I start going <laughs> my tongue. But um, It's like he, being on stage accepting an Oscar. You just you're you like, forget all the names. <laughs> I should have put a sheet of paper. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. Every stage of your career, you should have mentors and mentorships, and you should change them out, get a diverse uh, opinion set, um, get both male and female mentors. Um, that's that's what benefited me, I feel, um, getting to know, you know, different dynamics, different, even they don't have to be in the space industry. Mm-hmm. You know, just be someone that you you respect and has done really good things and you want to emulate a, a part a part of them yeah well thank you so much charity for um taking the time to chat with me this has been a very interesting half hour and i'm pretty sure our listeners will appreciate it um we'll be following your mission we wish you the best of luck i hope it's a raving success thank you i know it will be <laughs> and safe travels to you because I know you're quite the globe trotter. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate it. Thank you. In the description of this podcast, you will find links to information regarding the topics discussed, including AstroScale's website address. Thank you for listening to the Idea Me Show. If you like our content, subscribe to our podcasts and YouTube channels. That way you will receive alerts every time one of our interviews goes live. We appreciate your support. Until next time, goodbye.